We now move to the Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Bill. And the question is that point one start, a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Uh, uh, point of order, Grant Robertson. I seek the leave of the House that we report progress on this Exclusive Economic Zone Bill in order that the Bill and its accompanying SOPs be referred back to the Local Government and Environment Select Committee. Uh, well, yeah, what, um, you can seek leave that we report progress. I'm not sure if the additional instruction or the reason is in order. So all the member does is just... A point of order. A point of order, Grant Robertson. Mr Speaker, I seek leave that we report progress on this bill. Uh, leave us... Uh, no, you... Is it, uh, seeking leave? Yes. Leave us sought to report progress. Is there anyone opposed to that course of action? Yes. There is. So uh, the, uh, the question is that part one, stand part. Mr Chair. Uh, Grant Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Uh, the Labor Party would very much like to see this bill return to the Local Government and Environment Select Committee. The reason we would like that to happen in large part relates to SOP number 100 in the name of the Minister, Amy Adams. This SOP runs to some uh, nine or so pages of amendments, or actually longer than that, Mr. Mr Chair, some 13 or 14 pages of amendments that have been put down in the name of the Minister. Many of these are significant. They make substantive change to the Bill. They are not issues that were dealt with in detail by the Select Committee. We are concerned on this side of the House that they create loopholes in the law that will be exploited by people who want to undertake activity in the economic zone. There are some areas where we are simply not sure what the effect will be, and we need the opportunity for, as a parliament, for officials to take the time to go back and look at these changes and give advice to this parliament as to whether or not these uh, changes will have the kind of impacts that we believe they will. We will, of course, now ask questions of the Minister for the Environment about these changes as we go through, but that is clearly not the best way to be able to ensure that this Parliament is passing legislation that we believe will be robust. Dropping on the House in the way the Minister has substantive changes to questions like time limits for hearings, uh, the way in which uh, uh, existing petroleum activities become discretionary, uh, questions around um, when mineral, mineral prospecting and exploration may continue and commence, and for instance, for planned activities. These are significant issues and significant changes from what has previously been put before this House, and I think it is a shame that the Government is not prepared to take the time to get this right. Everybody in this House acknowledges the importance of creating a robust regime around our exclusive economic zone and the activities that take place within, the, within that area. On the first reading of this bill, the Labor Party opposed this legislation because we believed that it was inadequate in terms of providing that robust regime. We believe now, after both the, the second reading, uh, the com Select Committee's amendments and indeed the Minister's amendments, that it is still inadequate in terms of providing that regime, and what's more is now becoming is likely to increase uncertainty around activity in the zone. The, the government has an opportunity to provide that clarity if it would at least refer this back. Mr Chair, uh, in, in the first of my contributions on, on part one, I want to make clear that we are uh, appreciative of the fact that the Minister for the Environment has made some changes to the purpose clause of this bill, clause 10. There was a significant amount of uh, feedback submissions from not just opposition parties, but also a range of environmental groups who said that the purpose clause, as put up by the Minister initially, was not a sufficient, uh, uh, sufficiently robust uh, overall framework in which this bill would be, uh, would be looked at. It tried to create a balance between economic development and in the environment, and as many submitters said, it is not a matter of balance in this case. Now, the Minister has returned to us with a clause around sustainable management that is drawn from the Resource Management Act. That is a step in the right direction. That is good, but it is not part of 
what we would see as being the full, right and correct answer. So I am indeed, part one, clause 10, looks at, um, for the benefit of the uh, junior whip on the government side, uh, has the purpose statement in it. And the purpose statement, <laughs> the purpose statement is now one that reflects the Resource Management Act, but it does not reflect the international obligations that New Zealand has. We need to go further than the Resource Management Act when it comes to our exclusive economic zone. And the reason for that, Mr Chair, is that our ability to make law in the exclusive economic zone arises from our, our ratification and our signatory of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is absolutely clear in Article 192. That provides that states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. That is what is called a general obligation. It stands alone as Article 192 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. As the, par Mr. Chair, Grant Robertson. As the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment has noted, it is an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. Economic activity is allowable, but protection and preservation of the marine environment is essential and required. And that's why Article 192 provides for that. Article 193 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea does allow for the exploitation of natural resources pursuant to their environmental policies and in accordance with their duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. The purpose clause of the Exclusive Economic Zone Bill must show to all those who are interested in activity in the Exclusive Economic Zone that the protection and the preservation of the marine environment is the baseline understanding of how that activity will happen. And at the moment, despite moving the purpose clause to a better place than it was, we don't see the language of protection and preservation appearing in clause 10. There was a lot of talk about making uh, this bill consistent with the Resource Management Act during the committee stages, and that was a, uh, an important consideration. But it goes beyond that because the, the, the Resource Management Act covers what happens out to 12 miles, and we want to ensure consistency. But the issues that imp impinge upon the area between 12 miles and 200 miles are larger than that and require a recognition of the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Now, if the Minister wanted to take on that notion, it would be possible to at least go an even further step towards getting us in line with our international obligations by providing to decision makers under the Act the matters that they would need to take into account, just as the Resource Management Act does in Section 6 of the Resource Management Act. So it's all very well putting Section 5 of the Resource Management Act in as the purpose clause, but in the absence of, the, of giving an indication to decision makers about what are the matters of importance that are needed, this clause falls short of providing New Zealanders with the assurance that they have a, a bill and a law that will protect and preserve the marine environment. Most of the organisations that have submitted on this bill have said they accept that there will be economic activity within our exclusive economic zone. But New Zealanders looking at that and looking back to events in the Gulf of Mexico and concerned about the isolation of New Zealand want to know that, new, that lawmakers understand the importance of creating a regime that is robust and based around those core principles of protection and preservation of the marine environment. That is absent from Clause 10. It is absent from any other part of this part of the bill. And that makes it very difficult for opposition parties, particularly, and um, can only speak on behalf of the Labour Party, to be able to support a bill like this. It's made far worse, Mr Chair, by having other matters included in the Minister's SOP. So there are supplementary order papers on the table, both from Labour Party members and from the Green Party as well, that are asking the Minister to relook again at Clause 10 of this bill and to give this bill a purpose 
that allows for New Zealanders to say we know our marine environment will be protected and preserved and to say to the rest of the world we are taking our international obligations under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea seriously. So we urge the Minister to look at the SOPs that are on the table that would amend Clause 10. It is indeed welcome that, that a gov the Government has listened to submitters about consistency with the RMA, but this, while that is good, Mr uh, Chair, it is not good enough. Mr Chair, uh, in, in the few uh, moments remaining in this of my first call around this part, I also want to note that there are a number of other issues that haven't been dealt with in the Minister's SOP uh, that we believe should be dealt with, particularly around questions of uh, the uh, the way in which the Treaty of Waitangi is represented. There are also SOPs on that. Um, we will have an SOP from Annette King that seeks to extend those clauses that relate to the Treaty of Waitangi to Moriori. That was an issue that was raised in the Select Committee. It's one that we believe uh, is important that is noted uh, uh, here when we come to this particular part of the bill. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Honourable Amy Adams. <coughs> yes, thank